Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive uh, Phragmites session. Uh, my name is Sarah Sanon, and I will be your moderator for this morning. If you have any questions uh, during our presentations, I ask that you direct them to the question chat box in the control panel, and they will be answered after all the presentations are finished. Our first speaker today is Heather Braun, and I'll just share my screen so you can get a good picture of her. Oh, where am I? There we go. Heather, Heather is a habitat biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service, working primarily on the management of Phragmites and the recovery of native species in the Long Point region of Ontario. Heather has been with the CWS since 2018 and has, uh, has experience working on invasive species and wetlands uh, conservation issues throughout the Great Lakes. Prior to joining CWS, she worked for the Great Lakes Commission and Ducks Unlimited, incorporated both based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The spread of non-native Phragmites threatens many species at risk in Ontario. This presentation will provide an overview of species being impacted by Phragmites, why they are being impacted, and what can be done to address recovery. So Heather, I'm gonna switch it over to you and you should be able to share your screen. Great. All right, so you should be good to go. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Great. There we go, perfect. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. Um, my name is Heather Braun, and I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Service, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Phragmites and its impacts on species at risk. So just a bit of an overview. Sorry, I have to move things around because I'm blocking my, <laughs> my screen when I uh, look at my webcam. Um, Today for uh, the presentation, we're going to talk briefly about what Phragmites is. I, I'm going to assume that a lot of people on the phone know what it is, but I'll just touch on that briefly. And then we'll go through what the impacts are um, for that species on, on species at risk. And next, I want to talk about what can be done. So how can we manage Phragmites in light of the presence of species at risk? And then what are the outcomes? So um, this is the conclusion right here, just some key takeaways for the presentation today before we even get started. Um, one is that species at risk are impacted by Phragmites, but management can contribute to the recovery of species at risk. However, management can also negatively impact species at risk and therefore mitigation and monitoring are necessary to reduce that risk. Um, on Phragmites, Phrag has been described as Canada's worst invasive plant. It is a tall uh, invasive perennial grass that grows up to five meters tall. It has a cousin, which is a native species, which um, uh, occurs throughout Ontario and plays much more friendly with other species. Phragmites spreads by rhizomes, stolen stems, and seeds, and it outcompetes native vegetation, particularly in wetlands, growing into these really dense monotypic stands, as you can see in the bottom right corner uh, of the slide. You can also see that the below ground biomass of this plant is extremely dense, and other plants are really impacted by um, the prolific root system of Phragmites. Uh, which just which just takes up space from everything else. So Phragmites causes a, a loss of biodiversity and habitat for wildlife, including species at risk. But it also impacts um, other things such as agriculture and drainage. Uh, there's also a risk of road safety and there must be maintenance costs associated with frag management along roadsides. And for many of us, <clears throat> uh, FRAG impacts property values and associated recreation and tourism. So there's lots of reasons to manage Phragmites. And for the Canadian Wildlife Service and um, several of our partners on the phone today, species at risk is uh, a main uh, driving factor for us wanting to manage Phragmites. So as I stated, Phragmites is an aggressive invader and it spreads rapidly. 
it alters the habitat structure of wetlands and in coastal areas by forming these dense stands that choke out native vegetation. And this causes a decrease in the uh, diversity of both plants and animals in areas such as wetlands, which are typically known as being extremely diverse. Vascular plants such as bent spike rush and American water willow are most affected due to their inability to um, to uh, to work within to compete with frags robust root system but marsh breeding birds and amphibians and reptiles are also affected by frag due to the loss of their critical habitat currently there are over 200 species listed on the species at risk list in ontario and 25 percent of those are considered threatened by phragmites Another 22% are believed to be potentially at risk due to Phragmites. And in the species at risk uh, recovery documents managed by the federal government, 14% of those species at risk documents specifically uh, recommend the management of Frag as a recovery action for species at risk. So, um, this is a lot of species that we're talking about, and I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them. But I do want to highlight a few species that are particularly threatened. Herptifauna are greatly impacted by Phragmites because, um, um, and studies have noted that um, wetlands dominated by Phragmites support significantly fewer species of reptiles and amphibians compared to sites that uh, have little to no Phragmites. Spotted and blanding turtles, which are listed as endangered under the Species at Risk Act, are semi-aquatic species that rely on wetlands for feeding, mating, and overwintering. In Phragmites dominated wetlands, access to critical habitat necessary to complete, compete <clears throat> various life history stages is reduced. Where frag has taken over, these species spend a greater amount of time and energy avoiding the stands or attempting to cross them. When nesting females um, have, uh, when nesting, females have been recorded attempting to cross through stands, um, and this just takes up a lot more energy than would be typical in a in their uh, desired habitat. And further, shading caused by these tall uh, tall frag stands on beaches can lower the temperatures of the surrounding microenvironment and reduce hatching success. 21% of SARA listed bird species are also considered at risk due to Phragmites invasion, the majority of which are marsh breeding birds such as the least bittern and the king rail. Um, we do know that some birds will continue to use frag dominated habitat. Um, but the reduction of viable habitat results in fewer species being able to utilize it. And the ones that do use Phragmites uh, face less productive habitat due to the increase, or the, I'm sorry, the decrease of open water in wetlands and the re uh, reduced availability of prey and nesting sites. I'm hearing a little background noise. Just point that out for anyone who's interested. Um, so fortunately, we know that there are ways to manage Phragmites. Unfortunately, um, management is not easy. 40 years of research has demonstrated that Frag must be managed <clears throat> through an integrated pest management program. There is no single method that is effective at managing Phragmites. You can't just pull it, you can't just burn it, you can't even just apply herbicide to it. There has to be um, additional methods implemented and management must occur over many years. And the choice of the management tool selected depends on a number of factors, including um, your objective and why you're managing Phragmites, the scale of the infestation, applicable laws and regulations, um, all sorts of factors, even your, your individual capacity. A new best management practices guide was just published by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council in 2020. And I would encourage everyone to pick up a copy of this if you haven't. 
It includes detailed information on the species at risk impacted by Phragmites and provides descriptions on management practices and evaluating which, op uh, which option is most appropriate for your circumstance. It also includes information on planning, such as uh, what permits may be required and uh, what, uh, what recommended monitoring actions are. Two of the practices being used in Ontario currently uh, to improve habitat for species at risk and other wildlife include herbicide application, followed by the removal of standing dead bio biomass, uh, repeated as necessary over multiple years, and selective cutting or spading. And I've included some photos. Um, cutting underwater is something that's um, been um, spearheaded by Janice Gilbert, who will be speaking later, um, as uh, through the use of this Truxor machine, as well as cutting the stem below sediment through a, a method called spading, which has also been um, spearheaded in Ontario. Overall, herbicide, when applied at the right time and with the right follow-up treatment, is the most effective way to manage Phragmites and both the research from the US and a five-year program in Ontario has found that we're getting about 99 plus percent of Phragmites killed by using herbicide followed up with um, rolling to remove the standing dead biomass, um, which is just um, excellent efficacy. However, <laughs> There's always that, however. Um, as of today, there is no licensed herbicide available for the use in wetlands in Canada. Uh, we have been um, able to use herbicide in the Long Point region since 2016 for the management of Phragmites uh, through an emergency registration of the herbicide glyphosate through the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. This is a very... Um, uh, unique program and it is uh, it means that herbicide is only available in this specific area and only to specific managers and the reason that this approach was selected was because of the scale of the uh, issue there is over there were over 2,000 hectares of Phragmites in that region and um, the ability to use herbicide by air uh, was less impactful um, to um, species at risk than uh, other techniques. So one thing that I want to mention is that when you do any form of management, and, and actually when you do anything in your life, risk is inevitable. For species at risk, we know that there are risks associated with management. Species at risk and other wildlife may be impacted by management activities, but there are also risks from no management. So species at risk will be, continue to be impacted as Phragmites spreads. Migratory birds and other wildlife will be impacted. Wetland diversity will be reduced and Phragmites will spread to adjacent lands. So we recognize that there are risks associated with habitat management. If we choose not to manage FRAG, we will continue to experience those risks. And the challenge we face as managers is to find that balance between doing the most good with the least amount of harm. So in order to do this, uh, we are compelled to do, um, to do what it takes to reduce the risks to the extent possible. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the management for Phragmites is conducted during the fall and the winter, which is when most species at risk and wildlife have migrated or have limited activity. But regardless, we need to do our best to avoid those critical life stages. We also need to choose best practices that minimize risk. And so for the Canadian Wildlife Service project in the Long Point area where we're working on a landscape that has thousands of hectares of Phragmites, applying an herbicide that we know to be safe and is monitored for safety um, by helicopter is less impactful than applying herbicide throughout that entire area by ground. 
we still do ground application, but it's in areas where um, we have species at risk or uh, we need to, uh, we have buffer areas um, where there's a potential for drift or something from the aircraft that we need to avoid. So we always work with experienced contractors. Uh, we incorporate buffer zones around SAR to ensure that um, when we apply herbicide, we're nowhere near those species. And if we encounter a SAR while we're doing any form of management, we stop work and have a plan to avoid um, that species. And then, of course, we monitor everything that we do. So just a little bit about monitoring. And I really encourage everyone to do this. But what you choose to monitor depends on your objectives and what you want to see after the Phragmites has been managed. So do you want to know how well your management treatment controlled Phragmites? Or do you want to know what vegetation comes back or what the effects of the treatment are on wetland species? Um, for our project in the Long Point region, we are doing all of this. Um, and that's how we know that the efficacy of our treatment is about 99% plus successful. Um, but we're also looking at species recovery. So what vegetation comes back post-treatment and how are species, um, SAR species in particular, responding? So we're looking at uh, fowler's toad, SAR turtles and snakes, marsh birds and amphib amphibians, and fish and fish habitat. Monitoring is something that's beneficial to your project and it also promotes adaptive management so that you can refine and uh, improve your program over time. Monitoring is also beneficial to species at risk because the results are used to inform critical habitat and recovery strategies um, which are associated with their recovery documents. So the good news is this is a good news story, is that management is working. Uh, this photo is, um, is an aerial photo in the Long Point region. On the left side of your screen, you'll see an area that was managed by air and by ground at the Long Point Provincial Park. Um, you can see that there's a lot of green left on the screen, and that is cattail and other species. Um, or on the right side of the screen, the light color is Phragmites. It has not been managed yet. Um, and the darker green is cattail. So you can see the sort of the before and, and after uh, circumstance. And of course, over time, the vegetation, native vegetation on the left side of the screen will recover. And um, we expect to get the diversity of uh, wetlands that are typical of the Long Point region. There has also been several uh, papers published recently by both um, Rebecca Rooney and Courtney Robichaud at the University of Waterloo and by um, uh, Tozer and McKenzie at Birds Canada showing that there is a recovery of species associated with this um, frag management project. And so I would encourage you uh, to look into that, but we are seeing positive changes for species such as Fowler's toad and, and uh, bent spike rush, um, as well as um, other wildlife. So in conclusion, um, species at risk are directly impacted by Phragmites. They're both directly and indirectly related and um, the direct relationship compels us to, to look toward managing Phragmites. And management can contribute to the recovery of SAR and we are now seeing that in Ontario after five years of management. However, management has the potential to negatively impact SAR. And so we must conduct mitigation and monitoring um, as necessary to reduce risks to those species. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. That was a great presentation to begin. I'm now just going to introduce our next speaker. All right, so our next speaker is Eric Cleland. 
Eric is the director of the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Invasive Species Program in Ontario. He has been involved in invasive species management and habitat restoration for over 20 years. Eric's, Eric leads Canada's largest Phragmites control program in the Long Point region, which explores the opportunity to use aquatic herbicides for the control of invasive Phragmites in coastal and inland habitats. For years, Phragmites management has been happening all across Ontario in an effort to slow the spread of this aggressive invader. Recently, a group of organizations called the Green Shovels Collaborative received funding support to develop a Phragmites strategy for the province of Ontario. This presentation provides an update on the strategy development, including next steps towards completion. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Eric, and you can get started. All right, you should be able to share your screen. Can you see the sharing tab, Eric? There we go. Eric, did you unmute yourself? There we go. Can you see my screen now? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm very excited today to talk about a new Phragmites management project that's a little bit different in Ontario. Um, as Sarah mentioned in the uh, in the introduction, um, we have uh, been working for well over a decade in Ontario to control Phragmites uh, in a variety of different ways, and um, these efforts could could benefit from increased collaboration and coordination. And so um, we're very excited that uh, we found some funding support to do this work. Okay, um, so who is we? Uh, as uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, uh, the Green Shovels Collaborative is a is a group of organizations in Ontario that uh, are working together um, through their membership to um, to forward uh, invasive species management in a variety of different ways. And and really, there's about six key organizations that are working together as part of the Green Shovels Collaborative. We have Ducks Unlimited, the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre. And all together, we're uh, working under the umbrella of the Invasive Species Centre, who is the coordinating body for this particular project. And really the, the impetus behind this work was to capitalize on some of the opportunities that might come out um, as far as stimulus funding from uh, provincial and federal governments as a result of a response to the COVID-19 situation in Canada right now. So just a little bit about the project background. Um, the Green Shovels group came together with this common agenda of sharing the impacts and addressing the impacts of invasive species um, and strengthening the link between green projects and uh, economic stimulus and job creation. So in, in reality, um, there, there usually is an opportunity when these types of um, economic stimulus comes out for, um, for moving money into the green sector and away from some of the traditional sources and we felt it was a great opportunity to begin some of the work that um, many of our organizations are interested in. And so under the leadership of the Invasive Species Center, our group prepared um, what essentially is a menu of projects that were kind of ready to go um, to share with the governments um, over the course of, of 2020. Um, and, and as part of that um, uh, outreach, we reached out to various ministries, had meetings and discussions about on what the opportunities might be for some of the projects and really that resulted in a meeting with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, who demonstrated some interest in a couple of our project ideas 
Um, one was around the development of a, a, a Ontario-wide strategy for managing Phragmites and, and a second project, which I'm not going to speak to today, around uh, new tools to support uh, invasive species management in general. So the project really lifted off the ground back in November of 2020 when we received that commitment of funding support from the Provincial Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, we began to meet quite regularly as a Green Shovels group, um, knowing that we had a very tight delivery timeline, which is the end of this month, uh, March 31st. And so we've been working very expeditiously uh, towards this goal. Um, NCC took the lead for development of the strategy, given our background and involvement in Phragmites management in Ontario. And um, quite honestly, with the tight timeline and knowing the expertise that exists out there, we reached out to partner with a couple of very important organizations that weren't currently members of the Green Shovels Collaborative. And that's the Invasive Phragmites Control Centre um, at Janice Gilbert's organization and the Ontario Invasive Plant Council to really help us ramp up our capacity to, to reach out to Phragmites practitioners and gather their input towards a provincial strategy. So the overall goal of this group is to achieve efficient and coordinated approach to not only the management of Phragmites, but also prevention, because there are parts of Ontario where prevention is still um, an important goal that we should be working towards. And the main objectives of the project is really to describe the current state of Phrag management in Ontario. So how we're doing it and where we're doing it, um, the type of people are doing it. Uh, and also uh, primarily to develop a long-term framework to guide uh, Phragmites management in Ontario uh, and, and in particular to uh, improve coordination and look at potentially a regional level approach so that we're having a landscape scale impact that involves all of the important partners um, in, an, in a regional project. Um, another key aspect of the project will be to demonstrate the value of investing in pre prevention and control. There are many places that aren't doing any work to control Phragmites now, and, and really it's because there's uh, not a sound understanding of the costs or the impacts uh, Phragmites is having on, on budgets annually, um, and also the value in, in, in doing the work and what, uh, what, what comes out of that from a positive perspective. Um, we want to suggest potential future communication opportunities, training and capacity building needs and further outreach efforts. And, and really, at the end of the day, we want to enable better on the ground action um, in, a, in a coordinated approach. So where did we start to, to get our information? Well, it seemed appropriate to reach out to the Phragmites community. And so um, with the help of the uh, Ontario Phragmites Working Group and the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, um, through their annual general meetings in January, we reached hundreds of invasive plant managers and uh, took the opportunity to get their feedback. Um, we also engaged the Ontario Invasive Plant Council to lead the development of a Phragmites Practitioner Survey and really the, the focus of this survey was to ask the five W's uh, around Phragmites management. Who's doing it? Where are they doing it? How much does it cost? What are the strengths and opportunities um, where we can improve Phragmites management and coordination? And also start to understand the financials and, and the scope of the different delivery models because there are projects that are you know, limited to one small property and volunteer driven um, to wide ranging landscape scale programs in Ontario. Um, we took uh, five deep dives into some of the existing Phragmites projects across the province to give, gather some further insight on, on how those groups are working and, and what the opportunities might be to, to better improve or, or make their efforts more efficient. And lastly, at the end of January, we held a practitioner workshop, which was attended by over 60 practitioners, um, including breakout sessions to go, th go through some draft um, priority goals and objectives that should be incorporated into the strategy. So a little bit more about the goals and objectives for this strategy. There are five key overarching goals. And the first one is really to improve coordination. And we wanna see governments and indigenous communities um, successfully collaborating with all of the people that are doing FRAG management in Ontario in, a, in an efficient and coordinated man manner. We suggest that there might need to be a governance model uh, struck to, to guide this process, uh, likely through a lead organization or agency to help coordinate. 
um, we recognize that there needs to be an increase in awareness across the province uh, of frag management and, and exactly the impacts of frag mighties, not just environmentally, but socially and economically as well. Um, there's an opportunity through that uh, coordination piece to share knowledge among practitioners, so little tools and tips and tricks to improve consistency, continuity and efficacy across the province. A second goal is really the, the heart of FRAG management, which is the prevention, control work, and actual monitoring of the work we're doing. We want to work towards uh, preventing new introductions, um, limiting the spread of existing infestations, um, find ways to achieve more on the ground control of FRAG mites, um, and that could be through development of new tools or, or techniques. Um, and also um, standardized monitoring programs. Heather just spoke to monitoring and how important it is. And, and the availability and capacity to deliver monitoring is uh, variable across the province, depending on the size of the project and the funding that they have. So working out some sort of standardized way to monitor our FRAG projects and perhaps report back on how Ontario is doing on FRAG Mighty's management. Uh, goal number three is about program sustainability. So if we're going to build uh, a large scale program for delivery in Ontario, we're going to need an innovative and sustainable funding model for FRAG control. Right now, practitioners are applying to every grant and community foundation they possibly can to piecemeal together projects um, and, and, and do as much as they possibly can with very little. Um, there's an opportunity maybe to improve that and, and, and look at, at non-traditional sources um, perhaps there's an opportunity to leverage um, seed money from, from our governments um, into a new method of, um, of providing a sustainable multi-year funding to these projects. Because um, as we all know as FRAG practitioners, uh, letting this, uh, this work go for just one year has a direct impact on our efforts. Uh, the fourth goal is reducing some barriers to effective and efficient FRAG management through uh, enhancements to government policy, legislation and regulations. Um, there are a, a number of different licenses one needs for Frag Mighty's management for, in fact, to treat it in all different um, uh, places it grows in Ontario. There are barriers to um, uh, uh, accessing permits and letters of opinions under the Pes Pesticides Act that could be uh, potentially improved or, or made more efficient. So we wanna look at some of those uh, important needs that'll help uh, build capacity. And lastly, I think Ontario needs to continue to position itself as a leader in research and innovation in Fragmites management. So there are some really great initiatives going on already uh, across the country relating to Frag and new tools, new techniques, um, some really interesting work we're gonna hear about later this morning on biocontrol options that are being explored in Canada. So uh, continuing to support that innovation and research is really critical. Um, and, and another key part is demonstrating the value of actually investing in this provincial strategy once we have it written. And this is an effort that's being led by the Invasive Species Centre in partnership with Dr. Richard Vine and Colleen Cirillo from the University of Guelph. Um, and the motivation here is we all know that Phragmites is the most expensive plant for almost everyone to manage, but municipalities in particular who are carrying a, a good portion of the burden. Um, and, and it has clear impacts to every sector and, and person and every walk of life in the province. It impacts all of us in a different way. So capturing those motivations is really critical. Um, and then demonstrating that value uh, for of current and future investment in FRAG management will be critical to, to getting buy-in for delivery of the, of the strategy. So the approach is really to try to synthesize all the known costs and benefits relating to FRAG management. And those are both direct and indirect. Everything from the preservation of property values and infrastructure assets that decline as FRAG impacts them, um, the ecosystem services that um, healthy ecosystems provide when they're not inundated with invasive species, um, the costs uh, that directly you know, impact those that are trying to implement the work. So how much does frag control really cost in, uh, in the range of circumstances and habitats that we're working in across Ontario? And then lastly is the impact. And so we wanna synthesize this information um, in a way that will help demonstrate that there actually is a surplus value. It's not just a break even, but there's actually a net positive value in uh, taking action to control frag mites. 
And so we're working closely to try to detail out some of those comprehensive management costs. Um, some of the easier ones that are coming to the top so far from the input from our FRAG practitioners across the province is uh, roadside values and, and uh, rather uh, similar landscape conditions such as backpack spraying or, or cutting to drown. And so how do we put this provincial strategy in action? Because it's really important that this doesn't become another shelf document and that it actually gets enacted upon. And, and I'm pleased to say that that work is actually starting right now in this first phase of the project. Um, this year alone, we have supported capacity in four different Phragmites control programs going on in the province. And these small injections of cash really make a big difference to volunteer driven uh, projects in particular, which is where we focused a lot of our efforts this time around. And that includes increasing equipment that's available to do work from sleighs to drag biomass and barges and waders, GPS units, backpack sprayers, um, supporting material and supply purchase like personal protective equipment and herbicide, performing species at risk surveys before uh, management is undertaken, uh, increasing access to remote areas, uh, building interpretive signage for awareness and support in the local communities, which in turn builds um, ongoing support for our work. And, and with new tools potentially coming down the pipe, increasing the number of licensed exterminators really goes a long way for some of these projects. So putting it into action, next steps. Uh, so where's 2021 hopefully gonna take us? Well, we're still writing that draft strategy right now. Um, we'll hope to share that at the end of the month with the MNRF, um, get their feedback and incorporate it into a, a finalized document that we can share more broadly. Um, we'll also be looking to then seek support to implement the strategy because we really wanna see it as a, as a bit of an action plan to go forward. And some of the key themes we see as priorities for rollout potentially in 2021 are uh, an enhanced province-wide communication and awareness plan, um, similar to what has been done for other invasive plants in the past, like uh, purple loosestrife, for example, there was a very good awareness program a couple of decades ago for that plant. Um, that development and, and, and fleshing out of that, that governance model or coordination structure through some type of lead agency or organization, um, looking at some critical landscapes that should see on the ground funding support in 2021. So we're kind of keeping some of that on the ground action rolling forward, perhaps supporting, you know, early, early measures in Northern Ontario or some of the existing projects in, in Southern Ontario. Um, finalizing the regional delivery model and, and perhaps developing some templates for regional implementation plans. So to, just to make it easier for municipalities and conservation authorities and other groups that want to, to take the charge in their local jurisdiction um, to have kind of a, a template to work from that's been, been developed using successful models across Ontario. And then start asking that question about how to, how to fund this work going forward in a sustainable manner and get those funds into the hands of the projects on the ground. And that's really some critical next steps that we see for 2021. And, uh, that I, I need to say thanks and I'll stop there. Um, uh, the big thank you goes out to the people that are doing Phragmites management right now and have participated in the development of this strategy, provided input and information and filled out the very long survey we asked them to fill out back in January. Um, the folks that attended our, our workshops and participated in our case studies is really beneficial. I can't thank you enough. Um, our, our partners who have been brought on to help develop the strategy have been instrumental thus far. The Ontario Invasive Plant Council has been very helpful in, uh, in leading the survey work and the workshop and helping develop the case studies. Um, the members of the Ontario Phragmites Working Group, which are uh, tireless supporters of frag management. Uh, Janice Gilbert and Francis Shua from the Invasive Phragmites Control Center. Uh, my colleagues at the Green Shovels Collaborative. Um, of course, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for helping fund this work and making it happen and, and, and seeing the bigger picture for frag management in Ontario. And lastly, my colleagues at NCC, uh, Vari McFarland, who's been helping me through this project from day one, and, and Brett Norman, who's been taking care of all my other work while I work on this. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. That was wonderful. Our next speaker is Brooke Harrison, 
Brooke is a project coordinator at the Georgian Bay Forever and works closely on the Community Frag Busting Project. Brooke, I'll switch it over to you when you're ready. You should be good to go. Great, thank you, Sarah. Is that, is that thing paused for you guys? Oh, we're just seeing a white screen right now. And yeah, we can see it in your editing mode here. But... Oh, there we go. You're good to go. Perfect. Great, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for having this and thank you for setting this up today. Um, my name is Brooke Harrison and I'm the project coordinator here at Virgin Bay Forever. Just find my mouse, there, there we go. So just to quickly, um, for those of you who don't know, Georgian Bay Forever is a charity dedicated to scientific research and public education on Georgian Bay's aquatic ecosystem. Our mission is to protect, enhance, and restore the aquatic ecosystem of Georgian Bay by funding accredited research on water levels, water quality, and ecosystem. Sorry, I'm just re realizing my webcam is also off. There we go. <laughs> so this presentation will highlight the importance of yearly mapping, developing, uh, developing a management plan, establishing who will control each stand using what tools, and it will also highlight the successes and challenges we have faced um, we, as a small group, um, we, that is very community controlled, uh, oriented. Um, we hope that we can kind of help and connect other smaller community organizations on how to start and develop an executive plan. So in 2019, we changed our program name from management plan to eradication plan. We know that eradication is possible along the shorelines and we are getting close. To ensure this program is successful, these are the seven components that lead to a successful program that we have identified. So planning, planning, um, as we know and as we've talked about already, um, whether it's on day one or year five, planning is important to ensure, ensure a successful program, one that is willing to involve, evolve and change and go with the times. Your plan should highlight the successes and challenges you are seeing, which is why it's important to undergo a yearly review. Securing resources. Um, so this is something that Eric just touched on, but um, and it will continue to always be a challenge for all organizations, whether we are big or small. Uh, the need for consistent funding is lacking, but it is uh, very encouraging to see that more and more groups are kind of accessing this funding. Um, our program is funded by a variety of different sources, um, uh, mainly by the municipalities that we work in, um, but also through Canada Suburb Jobs and private donors. Yearly mapping is very, very important. Uh, you cannot properly plan without knowing what you're dealing with. Mapping allows for early detection and to make sure any new growth is controlled immediately before getting out of hand. When we map, we measure the size, density, and we take photos, we look at the water depths and any other notes that may be important for years to come. So this could include if there's any neighboring vegetation, if it's a monoculture stand, kind of what, what are we seeing in these specific stands. So then this relates then to our, our next point, which is individual site plans. Um, we have developed every, every single stand that we work with has an individual site plan for the next five years. Uh, as Heather mentioned earlier, there is no one best way to control Phrygmites. It's very, very dependent on kind of the substrate you're working in, the water depth, kind of what area you are um, trying to give this treatment to. Um, these are developed in the these management plans are developed in the planning phase over the winter, uh, but it's not 
it's not solidified until the mapping is done. For us, we are dealing with sandy shorelines in southern Jordan Bay to the Canadian Shield towards Perry Sound. So we, um, we may we use different hand tools like the raspberry cane cutters or the still cutters, but then we also do use the truxers every year as well. Site plans evolve and change yearly, so you need to prepare for the updates and flexibility to these plans. When the site plan changes, that reflects on the successes that you're seeing in your program. So say in 2019, you needed five volunteers over five hours, but in 2020, you only needed two volunteers for two hours. That shows that the process was working and allows time to be spent on other different focus areas. So next is executing the plan. Field season is for us, it is with our GBS staff, partners, volunteers, um, actually going out and controlling this frag in a variety of different ways. Um, so that is kind of what all of this is leading up to, this actual removing the frag mites. Um, after this is when the analysis, so kind of really deep dive into what we're looking at. It's similar to mapping. We kind of go over the, the individual site plans. We look back on the program, what worked, what didn't work, record any of your, your field notes, create some maps. Um, this is definitely can take some time, um, but it's really, really important to kind of get all everything you learned in the field in through June, July, August, September, and really put it on paper and see, okay, Let's, well, it's fresh in our heads. What do we need to change for next year? Um, and then again, as highlighted earlier, commitment is so key. Um, what kind of you really need to establish? What is your goal within your establishment? Um, Georgian Bay Forever, we have our goal is to reach 90% uh, eradication by the year 2025. Um, so, what is what is your goal trying to re trying to reach? Really, really trying to identify what you're actually working towards. And I just want to note that once a site has been controlled, we put it into the, into the monitoring eradicated stage. Um, it is important to check on these stands for years to come uh, to make sure there's no regrowth occurring. And if there is, to make sure you control that right away, even if it's just one or two stocks. So for example, if in 2020 stand is, a, a stand was not visible, um, and it re but it received control in 2018 and 2019, that stand will stay in our records and mapping database for years to come. We really want to make sure that after all this work, we don't we don't just kind of put it away after a few years. So this is the rough kind of timeline that we follow. Um, again, it can kind of vary for for every every organization. But in winter is when we apply for funding. We work on attend conferences like this one. We learn. We plan for the program. Kind of really highlight what again what our goals are. Kind of revisit these site plans. In the spring is when we finalize the program, we hire summer students and we connect with cottage association, municipalities, volunteers, homeowners, a variety of different groups and organizations um, to really decide who will be cutting which sands. And that, so we know in the spring, it, when, when cutting season actually begins, we know exactly who is controlling each stand. In June is when we map everything. Again, I've really stress the importance of this. It's really important to map every single year to really go over how you're going to be controlling each stand. Is it monitoring? Did something not work that you did last year? You really want to kind of make sure you revisit every single site. July and August is when we are controlling. So this is when we 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 did it last year, but we typically we host community cuts. We the GBF staff is working out there. We have volunteers working out there. Cottage associations, everyone is actually in the uh, kind of in the water, actually doing the removal. And then September is um, when we usually bring the trucksters to um, to the to Georgian Bay. Um, and then this is though when the kind of analysis really starts um, starts going underway. You create the maps, kind of get an understanding of what worked, what didn't work. So I have a few maps to show you. Uh, this is just some examples. Uh, this map is the eastern shorelines of Georgian Bay as what we hope it to look like in 2025. So this is what our goals are. I said 90% by 2025 will be eradicated. So you can see um, if you kind of look at the map on the on the right hand side there, green is in the monitoring eradicated stage. So these sites, they'll still have to see some maintenance and check on it. Um, just to make sure nothing's growing back, but that is in the monitoring eradicated stage. And the yellow are the yellow sites are ones that have received control in the past, um, but may still need one or two years of control. So those are sites that are just so so massive, and majority of those ones we haven't actually been able to get to yet at this point. 
But in 2019, we de developed this five-year plan. Uh, there's about 570 sites on this on this map along the eastern shorelines, and we've been working with this for about eight years. But in 2019 was when we uh, really started changing it from um, Phragmites Control to Phragmites Eradication Program. So here's two maps side by side. This is, again, the eastern shorelines that we work within. Um, and this is 2019 versus 2020. So what this really shows you is that the process is working and our efforts are really starting to kind of be seen along the shorelines. So again, just a reminder, the green are sites now in the monitor and eradicated stage. Yellow are sites that have received at least one, uh, one method of control but are not yet eradicated or monitored. And the red are sites that we have mapped uh, but haven't actually been able to get to yet. So we are seeing many sites in the small under 10 meters squared category or in the monitored and eradicated stage. Each of the 579 sites have individual eradication plans to be controlled by either GBF summer students, homeowners, uh, cottage association, volunteers, kind of the, the variety of, of different ways to kind of attack these sites. So I'm going to just highlight specifically Township of Georgian Bay right now. So that is uh, includes Honey Harbor area. Um, this is just one of the focus areas that we work within. Um, but this chart, chart shows the five-year plan. So this was developed at the in 2019. And this is kind of what we go in and we kind of alter and kind of modify. So you can see we, we develop who is controlling it. Is it GBF staff? Is it staff and community members? Is it community members? And you can see it kind of going along this like conveyor belt, if you will. Our hope for this program is to be completely controlled by community members in the coming years. However, at this point, we are seeing stands too large um, for the aging community cottagers to control. Although 2020 was challenging as we were unable to host community cuts, we did have over 87 volunteers dedicate 500 hours and three staff who dedicated 1,600 hours. And at the end of 2020, we have 100, we cut approximately 110 stands and 272 are in the monitoring eradicated stage. Uh, and that is just through the township of Georgian Bay. So as we are mapping and controlling each of these stands, we make sure to talk to the local homeowner, cottage owners, um, and again, to kind of do this education aspect of it uh, that we know is so important. Why, why, why should people care? What are the impacts of it? How do you properly control it? How do you properly dispose of it? We really need to make sure the education side of it is, uh, is very, very strong to make sure everyone's doing it properly and safely. So again, here's just a few maps I'll quickly go through. So this was 2019 um, in Township of Georgian Bay. And this is 2020, so you can see a lot more green there. And then this is will be 2025. So you can see majority in Township of Georgian Bay will be in the monitoring eradicated stage at this point. Um, so how is this all done? Um, as as we've all kind of stressed and we all really know there's there's many different ways that this is done it's not there's not just one right answer of this is how we control phragmites there's many many different ways that we have to go about this so we separate the sites to under and over 10 meters squared smaller sites we recommend having two community volunteers for safety reasons and it might take one to two hours for medium sites, we task these to GBF staff with the help from community members and can take anywhere from two to five hours. And for the massive, massive sites, we've been working with the IPCC trucksters. And in so we had them in 2018 and 2019 to Honey Harbor. And this past year in 2020, we had them in Tay. And in just three days, they removed 50,000 pounds of, of biomass phragmites. Um, I often got the question about disposal. I think this is often um, a challenge for everyone and it really, this is kind of another thing to really uh, figure out during the planning process is how you're going to dispose of this biomass. Um, it really does depend on your municipality and where kind of what the rules are. So it does require some research to be done, but we in Tay Township, we work with a company called Bin City, which is just a large bin company, and they dispose of it properly for us. So you can kind of see in the middle here, this community disposal, they are bringing it into the bin and then uh, they dispose of it properly for us. However, for many of our sites, and I know a variety of different groups use this method, 
Um, we, for the small amounts of cup break, we bring it up to a rocky, sunny area that's high enough away from water. So change in water levels will never touch it and bring it back into the water. Um, but we leave it high and dry to dry out over winter and you just leave it there. And we make sure we, we record where it is that we are putting these um, bunches of Rankmites to make sure that we check on it for years to come to see if there is any regrowth. Uh, we have not seen that, but I know some have. So it, it is really make sure it, it's very important that if you are disposing it this way that you do kind of continue to check up on it. So just quickly some additional successes that um, that we have found to work for these community kind of driven groups. Uh, equipment rental. So we have a variety of different tools whether it be um, raspberry pin cutters or even just twine or the, the stills if people are trained on them. A variety of tools that people can rent say if, if someone has a patch in front of their cottage and they really want to want to control it and don't need the assistance, they've already been educated on us on how to do it. Uh, we kind of give them the tools, give them say three days or a week and they are responsible for controlling it. So it's, it's good just to have the equipment available. The community frag breasts are group leads. So Georgian Bay as many of us know is very massive and we cover a very large area in this program so each community along the shoreline has a lead who is well known in the community and is the go-to person for for us and then they kind of give the information to all of their um their members within the organization so in the spring is when we give them the site that they're responsible to control and then they can kind of delegate it to the different um, whoever is closest to those stands. So the community leads are, are very beneficial to just help with the communication process of it. Partners, this is um, something we can all agree on that we all have the common goal of controlling Pregmite. So when we all are working together, we just know that our goals will be reached that much quicker. So we work with many, many different groups and associations kind of within Georgian Bay, but also as a whole, whether it be Ontario Parks, NTO, Parks Canada, um, there's there's many, many people that are kind of doing this and, and we all benefit from learning from each other. And then this education learning uh, by attending events like this, we we kind of can all share ideas, share what doesn't work, share what does work, and really kind of have a better understanding of how to move forward. So I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for kind of doing your part in controlling Pregmides. Um, this is just kind of highlight the seven kind of points that work for us. Um, I will I will say that our 2020 report is now online and you can go to that or our 2019 report and there's there's lots of different information kind of on our website as well if anyone wants to reach out to kind of help with the kind of where to start or advice um definitely feel free to do that and on that note that is i will wrap up um yeah thank you thank you very much thanks brooke that was wonderful um our next presenter is the invasive species whisperer, I think, or the invasive Phragmites whisperer, Janice Gilbert. Janice is a wetland ecologist who received her PhD in environmental science from Ohio State University. She has been controlling Phragmites and species at risk habitats since 2007. Janice is the founder and co-chair of the Ontario Phragmites Working Group established in December 2011. She's a scientific advisor for the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative and established the Invasive Phragmites Control Center in 2017, a not-for-profit organization with a mandate to provide responsible solutions for managing Canada's worst invasive plant. This presentation provides uh, information on cutting to drown control methods and examples of successful control projects. It also highlights a few of the community-led programs underway on Lake Huron. I'll switch it over to you, Janice, and you should be good to go. Good morning. Can you see that okay? Yep, uh, we can see it great. Thank you. Well, first off, I want to I want to thank the Invasive Species Center for uh, this forum, and uh, I'm learning a lot actually through the week. Wild pigs, I didn't know <laughs> anything about those until I joined the session. It's pretty cool. Lots of really, I'm always learning lots about invasive 
species that are, are looming on our doorstep, but also the ones that are here. Um, thank you for arranging for this particular session. Uh, what great work going on in the province right now. It's just so exciting um, to see all the initiatives underway and, and uh, particularly the, the Green Shovels initiative with the Segway strategy. That's, that's all really encouraging. And certainly what's going on in Georgian Bay. Thanks, Brooke. That was, that's amazing community uh, work going on there. I, I uh, wanted to shed a little bit of light on some uh, really uh, uh, great projects going on as well in Lake Huron. And um, I'm focusing on, on those groups that are using the, the cutting to drown method with the understanding that we need all the tools as uh, Heather rightly pointed out. And uh, herbicide is certainly an important tool and, and having those water safe herbicides are gonna be critical for us uh, moving forward. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about the cutting to ground method, the, the tools that we're using, and then then uh, just highlight some of the projects going on in, uh, in Lake Huron, just a few of them. But first, uh, with the cutting to ground method, we need uh, some, some water uh, to, uh, for that to work. And, and uh, as many of us know, the, the Great Lakes, they have these cycles where they go up and they go down. So we have really, really low lake level periods that cause consternation. And then we have these really high level periods that also cause consternation and everything in between. And we have really good data sets um, in the 1800s that kind of track this. And we can see that there are you know, periods of, of seven to 10 years where we're high and we're low. And we are definitely in the, in the high cycle. When I first started looking at uh, Phragmites control um, back in the mid 2000s, the lake levels were low. And I, and I was looking, I did look at cutting to drown, went in in the winter time in this area where I knew the water would, would flood up naturally in the spring. So th this particular wetland system was, was open to the lake. It was hydrologically uh, um, controlled at all, no dikes or whatever. So well, let's, let's cut a, a 10 meter square patch, put some plots in here and just see what happens. And it was really cool because it worked. Um, where we found the, the frag had come back in, we could track actually the connection to those stocks that were outside of our plot. But the thing, the problem was the, the water was just too low in the lakes. And so there just wasn't enough water in the wetlands to make this a feasible option. So at that point in time, the lake level was low. We, we were, I was really focused on the herbicide application. And you can imagine how um, difficult that is when you're working in these wetlands where you have lots of dry areas and then you get to the water and, and it's, so it's even frustrating. But we were using that method quite well in a lot of these coastal wetlands up until uh, 2013 and then the water popped up. And so these areas where we could previously use herbicides, water's there, and we had nothing. So we're just kind of standing, staring out into this vast sea of Phragmites with water in it and, and wondering what, what we could do. And, and then the water kept going up and it kept going up and we were getting record high water were well over a meter uh, deeper than it had been during that, that low water period. So I was like, hey, let's have another look at this cutting to drown method because a lot of the Phragmites was in water deeper than a meter. And like anything else, I kind of want to understand this plant to figure out you know, what it's going to do uh, in these certain situations, what makes it such a survivor and such an invasive plant. If we look at Phragmites, it has a lot of structures uh, in it, a structural material that makes it really good for, for surviving of deeper water conditions. A lot of uh, aridcum, it's called, is the space for gas, for oxygen exchange. Um, and it has a lot of below ground structures as, as Heather showed uh, in one of her, her photos. So lots of uh, rhizomes and lots of um, um, gas chambers and below ground structures to hold the oxygen. It also has a lot of the standing dead that can uh, provide like straws, uh, kind of uh, a conduit for, for oxygen to flow from the atmosphere down through the water column. It can develop these adventitious roots. So basically there's these feathery roots up the stalk of the plant. Um, so it, it helps it absorb the oxygen in the water column, which is 10,000 times less than in the air in the atmosphere. And then they're connected below ground because they're a colonial uh, species. So here's an example of those adventitious roots. So this water here is over a meter deep and, and there's those, those roots coming up to get the water or the, water, or the oxygen out of the water column. And here's um, a, another example where that dot, hard dotted line or that black line there it shows the, where the sediment below and, and then the water above and there's even those feathery roots below in the sediment in wet conditions. And uh, 
as we know, there's a lot more biomass below ground than we, we, we can see above. And, and so these rhizomes uh, hold a lot of uh, oxygen. And then here's a, just a schematic of where you see they're kind of connected below ground. So even if they're growing out in the deeper water, they can have some connectivity to those plants in the shallower water and still get oxygen flowing through. And here's just a, a little a live example, a real example of, of uh, that sort of situation. So cutting the ground is not easy. I look at the, how Phragmites behaves in its natural environment over in Europe. There's a lot of research on Phragmites over there. And basically, um, in a lot of that literature, say, well, you know, the limiting factor in water depth for how far out into the lake it can go is about a meter and a half. We've actually seen it in deeper water in, in uh, Lake Huron, but that's kind of the, the limiting factor there. So knowing this, well, if we can cut off those straws way down in the water column, can we actually promote some, some drowning effect? And certainly in the shallower water, you can see where this particular uh, example of really high density Phragmites, we went in and we cut it, and the water's just not deep enough to uh, use up for the plant to use up all the oxygen that's stored below ground um, before it can pop up another shoot and then break the water surface and then it gets the oxygen flowing again. So water depths are certainly important. And when we first started doing this work, I'd set up plots in an area with really thick uh, density Phragmites and, and variable water depths. And, and basically what I found was that with one cutting, in the water, um, water about knee deep, we could achieve about 90% mortality. And if we got up to about thigh deep water, we could get close to 100%, uh, percent, if not 100% uh, 100, uh, 100 uh, mortality after one cut. Um, so there was a, from in my mind, there's a strong link to water depths and, and cutting to drown efficiencies, but I'm finding that that's not actually the only factor that's important. Water clarity as well. So in these deeper waters, where the, um, we eat well over a meter deep where we're cutting the frag, it can still grow back through. And it's mostly seen this up in Oliphant with a sandy soil, really clear water. And so the, it, um, it just doesn't get uh, churned up. There's, um, the sediment just falls out even windy days very quickly. So there's lots of clear clarity in that water. Contrast that to some, some water systems like uh, chocolate milk. Even less than uh, your knee deep, and we can we can um, have 100% mortality with one cut. But really interesting, um, and I guess it should have been no surprise, but we're learning as we go. I love this picture. These are the intrepid frag busters up in Oliphant. <laughs> you can see they're almost uh, shoulder deep water out, out cutting the frag. So the good news is this used to be really high density frag. We had cut it with the trucksters the previous year, and that's what was left. But still, that garden plant is, is growing in really deep water. So um, Burke had mentioned uh, tools that are used for, for cutting to, to drown. And I'm just gonna touch on these very briefly, but these particular ones, the spading, the king cutting, and the steel cutting are, are tools that any, anybody can actually use. Uh, the, the spading method was actually developed by, by Lynn Short, um, who's an instructor at uh, Humber College. And she started doing this on her shoreline where cottages in Wimblewood Beach really successfully got the youth involved. And we use her, her method in, in water where it's really soft substrate. So it has some, some limitations there, particularly, you know, when you don't have too much frag and, and you can use this method, but in shallower water, it seems to work. There are postcards that have been developed. We developed these a few years ago. You can get them on the Ontario Farmers Working Group website, or I can I can send them to you as well. And basically the theory is you just snip that stalk off down in the sediment, nice clean uh, uh, slice, and, and um, that helps uh, to uh, really stress the plants. The other method is with these cane cutters. They're available at Lee Valley. And again, we have postcards available for uh, showing how to uh, utilize uh, these, these tools. And I love this, these, uh, these methods because it's great. Any anybody at any age can come and do it. You, it's quiet, so you can talk on a hot summer day. What better activity to be doing out frag busting? I always tell people you do this, you don't need a gym membership, and it's very satisfying work. Uh, through a program with um, my partners, pretty Bruce Power, I've been able to offset the cost of these king cutters. So Lee Valley, you can buy them for about twenty-seven dollars, and uh, we're able to provide them for fifteen. 
And we also do uh, how-to workshops. So if any groups are interested to learn how to actually use these tools, we are certainly uh, available to, to uh, do that. You can see there's a lot of frag busters out there using the cane cutters, which is pretty neat. So therefore, more selective cutting, they work really well where you have Phragmites growing in amongst our native plants and you don't want to kill the native plants. But then when you get up to a little bit higher um, density of Phragmites, up to about 70%, that's not as efficient either. So we use these steel cutters and they're not meant for water, just so you know. Um, but we uh, have found ways, um, this is actually Frank Letourneau, uh, a contractor I worked with years ago, had introduced me to to this tool is really uh, fantastic. So we know how now to keep them uh, gr well greased and how to maintain them. And, and uh, my crew here back in 50, I still have those cutters. So we've had them for five years. You just have to know what, uh, how to maintain them to keep them operating uh, when they get the water in them. So that's pretty important. This is the first cutting to drown project I did uh, on, a, on a bigger scale. And so this was done manually with the steel cutters. And um, you see a really nice results there uh, at the bottom of your screen, but there is a limitation to what the crew can do, even though they're young and fit and, and uh, really uh, passionate doing this work. So um, I started thinking about how to uh, cut that Phragmites, but also to get the biomass out of the, the wetland, because that's a really important critical stage. And in the early days, we we're doing this all manually. Um, so, um, I had been looking at what they were using in Europe to cut Phragmites and, and uh, through um, Derek Scholten at um, Colvoy Equipment, um, he helped me get uh, trucks in 2017, as did my partners. This is when I established the Invasive Phragmites Control Center and Bruce Power, uh, Greenstream and the Lenten Shores Phragmites Community Group were really key partners in helping me get this established. And so in 2017, we had one truck, so we had, now as soon as we got working the first day, I thought, I need more. And so now we have three. But the beauty of these machines is they can go in and, and really deal with the high, uh, thick biomass that, that the, uh, the manual uh, crews just can't deal with. So that it can cut it, it can haul it out. Um, but there are uh, timing, uh, certainly considerations. And, and Heather did a really nice job of highlighting, you know, working in these, a lot of these systems, are species, they're habitats for species at risk and a lot of other wetland uh, dependent wildlife. So we have to be really cognizant of that. Uh, we don't do any work until the middle of July just for fish spawning regulations. But, you know, if you're even walking out with a large group, uh, just be cognizant of the fact you could be walking through fish nests. So, um, you know, there is a timing aspect to this, and it also helps with the, reducing the impact on nesting birds and, and that um, those other impacts for the, because the spring, the, like the wetlands are just hopping, whether or not they're full of frag or not, there's, there's still wildlife there. We, we absolutely have an experienced crew. We, we really uh, make sure that they're, they're uh, well-trained working in the systems. And then um, as has been highlighted uh, earlier uh, discussions, lots of site logistics. There's, there's a lot of uh, considerations every site we go to. And um, when somebody says to me, or I hear, you know, there's nothing in Phragmites, that's not true. The wildlife use the, utilize the edges of the Phragmites. They need that structure for their nesting. Um, because there's nothing else there. Um, and so just be cognizant of that. And, and some of these birds are late nesters as well. Um, and also too, on the edges of frag, there's there's a really nice habitat. So we are always cognizant of, of that. But the really cool thing on these structures, wildlife don't seem to care. I see more, oh, uh, there's a little least bitter. And I, I have all the years I spent in wetlands, I was, I was just so excited on the trucks and there he was just popping around looking at. Um, and, and so that's the other thing, you know, we are working in, in these uh, um, animals' um, homes, so we are always uh, very careful about how we operate, and uh, certainly the machines go slow when we're very observant. The muskrats love us. We create these floating mats of, of frag, and they come out and start munching away. They think they've died and gone to heaven. Um, so part of the uh, process is, is the containment piece when we're cutting the Phragmite. So we'll use booms or we'll actually leave a fringe out at the lakeside edge to keep the material contained. And that's because um, when the stalks fall into the water, they will re-sprout at the nodes. And if they're floating around and you're not collecting them, they, they will cause a bit of a huge issue. So any viable plant parts that, that Phragmite has um, will re-sprout and, and, and could recontaminate a site. So what do we do with the biomass? Well, in some areas, the trucksters can actually 
bring it right into shore and, and a soak in uh, manual labor. And when it dries out, if it's a suitable location, we can actually even burn that biomass. In other areas, we're making what I call these giant muskrat dens. So we find suitable locations in the wetlands where we're not going to harm uh, species plants or we're not impacting on areas where uh, there's a lot of uh, turtles or whatnot. Um, and so we work with a lot of uh, local knowledge scientists and, and biologists and whatnot to figure this out uh, and just understand the, these, these sites. But it's working really well. And, uh, Brooke mentioned that they dry out and they do. So if you just go back in the spring and if there's any resprouting, you can easily pull them out and just lay them on top to dry out. Um, if you leave them too long, then they'll develop uh, deeper roots. So it makes it a bit harder. Um, but um, we're doing this at a lot of sites now. And the reason for that is the, the wildlife are utilizing them for loafing platforms. This particular um, frag mountain up in Olifant we left on a, a flat rock out on one of the islands. Um, Leslie Wood told me there's like 40 common terns nesting on the structure. I see turtles using them for basking and the birds for, for loafing platforms because you think about it, you remove all of that Phragmites, um, there's nothing there until the plants regrow for the wildlife to utilize. So at least we're creating some structure. Uh, we just have to be careful where we place it so it doesn't get uh, blown out into the lake and spread around. So how do we remove the Phragmites in areas where we can't make those muskrat dens? We have these, these rafts. Uh, we can load them with the uh, truck sores or manually uh, load them, lots of volunteer effort. And then they have motors on them. We can take them to shore. And this is where uh, a lot of the municipalities in kind support has been absolutely huge for us. This is up on uh, town of South Bruce Peninsula. Every year they, they donate their, their guys, their crew, their backhoes to unload our, our uh, our, uh, our uh, biomass, and then they truck it to the local local site. So they, they're figuring they're figuring out where it goes. I, I just want to uh, I put together this map. These are just areas I know where there's cutting to drown. So I I am sh quite sure there's a lot more projects going on in the landscape uh, using this method this method as a, a main form of control. But I, I just wanted to highlight a few. Of these projects just to show some successes with this. So first we'll start up in Manitoulin Island and this is a project headed up by, by Judith Jones and she basically saw fragments, a huge threat on that island to a lot of the species of risk plants and animals um, back in these embayments. So she uh, asked us to come up with the truck source to help out with, um, this is Blue Jay Creek, Michaels Bay, it was about three kilometer long stretch embayment. And so we work with Judith's uh, crews, that's Judith on the still there with her, her crew and our manual crew and our truckster crews and cutting um, and, and uh, collecting. And she was able to hire a, a, bar, a local barge um, to help with the biomass removal. So we would take, as we got further and further away from the boat launch, uh, the biomass had to go further. So we had our collection barges or two trucks or all our crews. We got all the biomass to shore, and and there's um, the in kind support there from um, uh, uh, Township of uh, Takama, actually. And and so again, it's just critical uh, partnerships and, and and assistance with the biomass removal. That's at the local launch site there after a hard day of fragging. So there, here's an image of what that three kilometer long, long shoreline looked like. And, and uh, this is what it's like now. It can be controlled manually. And Judith told me last year they had minimal time spent there just with the cane cutters dealing with the regrowth. So a really nice success story. Go further down uh, to um, the North uh, Bruce Peninsula here into Oliphant. And this is a, a big project going on, headed up by the uh, Oliphant Fishing Islands Fragmites Community Group. Leslie Wood is the chair. Lots of partnerships you'll see here. Um, so basically, uh, lots of islands, uh, south end of um, Lake Huron, north of Sable Beach, lots of coastal wetlands, Phragmites just took over, just a sea of Phragmites um, when I first started working with the group in, um, back in 2017. And this is Leslie Wood, an intrepid fragger, and, and uh, Brooke kind of highlighted this. In every community, you need these people, the spearhead, uh, they're really passionate and, and really great at uh, community uh, building and partnership building. This certainly is an example of that. Uh, Leslie and her, her, her cousin Janet McNally and, and her husband and, and lots of fraggers spend thousands of hours out cane cutting and, and uh, uh, cleaning up where they can uh, along that, that whole entire area. 
Leslie uh, gives lots of deputations to council, uh, town of South Bruce, and they brought in in-kind support for this bin to haul away the Phragmites that all the community groups are, are dealing with. And when we come with our trucksters, we, uh, the, 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 the uh, volunteers just come out of the woodwork. It's just an amazing uh, project and, and Leslie coordinates all of this uh, work and there's uh, uh, they're called old guys with stills. They bought their own still cutters and they come out and um, ride bus for uh, until they <laughs> and need to go have a nap. And then the fraggers with the uh, fine tune um, uh, cane cutters also uh, come, come out of the woodwork to help. And then um, a new term for frag, the schleppers. This is another Leslie Wood term where they help pick up the, the biomass to, to get it out of there. So while uh, those volunteers are working with our manual crews and other um, uh, from other agencies, uh, the, uh, the, the truck stores are working in these higher density areas. And one of the council members, Paul McKenzie in, in 2019, he had a big barge. He, he brought it out, put a backhoe on it and started helping us uh, haul in the biomass. And that was a game changer for us. Um, last year, uh, he, he enlisted his son MJ and his brother Dan and one of the cottagers, Tom uh, Riddell, he, he just donated his big barge. And so with all the work going on, we were able to, to remove 168 dump truck loads uh, out of the, that system. So just lots of, uh, of open areas now. It was formerly uh, all frag socked in with Phragmites. Here's an example of uh, down the South Bruce. They were there every single day unloading our barges for us and, and trucking it away. Um, they would find uh, local uh, landfill areas. Chris Cornfield, the manager, really instrumental in helping us out with this. So, yeah, I remember uh, back in 2017, I was, I was standing on the uh, government dock looking out just to see a Phragmites and there's some local folks there and we had the one truckster and lots of volunteers and they're just like, why are they bothering? It, 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 it's pointless, it, it's useless. And this is why, because we're we're winning the battle and every year uh, the lo more and more local people are noticing that and, and there's more and more volunteers coming on. So it's pretty exciting. Further down the, the, the shoreline here is the home of the Lambton Shores Free Money's community group in Lambton Shores, headed up by Nancy Villar, just an amazing group of volunteers. I've uh, been at this for over a decade. They were the first ones to develop a, a, fra uh, a Phragmites mansion plan for a whole watershed, not just focusing on their beach in Port Franks. And uh, within this plan, uh, divided into certain uh, Phragmites management areas to make it more um, manageable, brought in the municipal and county and MTO road people to sort out all their jurisdictions and work together, and, and lots of community uh, uh, work going on. And one is the Upper Wash Frag Fighters headed up by Sandra Marshall. So they have these outreach um, every year. I don't believe they had it last year because of COVID, but they go and they, they uh, tag uh, the flag, the little frag, so, so uh, newbies can, can see what they're supposed to be stating and, and lots of volunteer effort on the shoreline and also inland in, in these dunes as well areas. Uh, with Nancy's group, one of the big projects is uh, this Wood Drive Coastal Wetlands, kind of orphaned wetland, a uh, uh, very rare uh, species in here, um, socked in with Phragmites. And so we started working there manually, cutting in 2015 and brought the trucksters in uh, every year. And, and so now in, in many of the sections of that large wetland, it's, it's uh, controllable just using the cane cutters. Uh, with volunteers. We did this very thoughtfully. We left a thick fringe out at the lake so the native plants could uh, regrow back in behind. Uh, so the, the, the fringe kind of intercepts that wave energy to allow that to happen. And then once the native plants had reestablished, we, we removed it. Further down the, the shoreline is a, a church camp, Lampton Shores, uh, um, Lampton Center. And they put in a pool because they couldn't use their, their beach. They uh, on the dry areas they had a contractor come and spray and then we came in with the, the truck source and opened up that shoreline for them and I'm just going to go quickly through this because I see I'm running out of time. But 2018 for the first year in a long, long time, the campers could actually use the lake. How cool is that? So we've just uh, systematically opened it up. They had a really fun event. Um, lots of volunteers came and where it was all thick frag, they could just spade and, and fine tune. So on the shoreline where it was dry, it was sprayed with herbicide and out in the water with the truck source. And that's their, that's their shoreline now. I'm just gonna quickly pop up to uh, King Carden area. This is a doppelganger. This is a, um, a camping center, Brewstow Conservation Area. And again, another nice partnership with the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation, Enbridge and Municipality of King Carden. 
And again, we started there manually cutting. We did all the spraying we could on the dry lands. And uh, so that's just a picture of what it was like out at the lake before we started. And now it can all be controlled. A lot of the campers actually donate their time with the cane cutters. It's just minimal upkeep right now. So really encouraging on that site. And all along the um, Miss Valley at Kincardine shoreline, every year they have a line item in their budget. For the 19 kilometers of shoreline, we're systematically cleaning it up. Um, and within Kincardine itself, there's these frag busters several kilometers of that shoreline uh, using the, the, the cane cutters and, and the skates um, and, the, and the stills. And I want to mention the Miss Kelly Kincardin, they covered all the liability for any of the, the work going on, as well as hauling away the, the biomass. A shout out to Georgian Bay forever. I often think about what that area would look like, Georgian Bay would look like without that work going on there. So um, it, it's just an amazing, amazing project. So thank you. And at the risk of Eric being upset with me, because there he is, he doesn't usually show his face. Also, shout out to Nature Conservancy Canada. Um, we do need uh, everybody working on this. And, and when Nature Conservancy started doing the work on uh, taking the lead in Long Point and elsewhere in the province, it's just been a game changer for us. I'm um, showing Esme, uh, she was instrumental in getting funding for a, a whole a watershed approach up in the North Bruce. So really exciting projects going on. Um, so I, I'm hoping I can convey to you that, you know, if you put in the effort and the partnerships and you have the right support, you can win the battle. Um, and if you, if you ignore it, it's going to be a problem for you. So just get on it as quick as you can. And it's really never too late. And also, it's really at the community level, all these passionate people that live in these areas that are, are putting in the, the hard work to make this happen and bringing all the partners that they need together. Um, so I, I just want to sit, um, put that, I hope I light a little bit of fire out there for some of you. I'm not sure if you should get started. Everyone can contribute, if, even if you just bring lemonade to the Frag Busters on a hot, hot summer day. I would be very remiss not to mention this plant at this, this forum. I think this is our next Phragmites. It, I've been watching it outcompete. This is a silver grass miscanthus. I've been watching it outcompete Phragmites on some of our highways. It's now wherever I go, like Highway 400. Um, near, it's near uh, Gravenhurst. It's near um, Godrich. It's it's down my way. This I think is our next Phragmites. So I think we need to be dealing with this plant. It's a pretty grass, but it's also very very um, aggressive, and uh, I think it's one that we need to to pay uh, close attention to and perhaps incorporating it with our roadside control uh, programs moving forward. And with that, I am three minutes over. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Janice. That was great. I was feeling pretty on a high there, like, oh, we have a chance against Phragmites. And you're like, no, brought me down to earth with that new invasive species. No, we so still have a chance. It's just getting started. We're good. You yeah, know? OK. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much for that. And with that, I think we're going to have to end it because the next session is starting in two minutes and we want to give them some time <laughs> that we wish we had at the beginning. So th thank you everyone for joining and thank you for presenting all my presenters. That was really wonderful. And our next session is on spotted lantern fire fly if you were interested.